Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dr. Brad Roberts, the director of the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's um, session with uh, Elbridge Colby, focused on the strategy of denial, American defense in an age of great power conflict. Uh, before introducing Bridge, let me just say a few words to help set the context. Uh, the 2018 version of the U.S. National Defense Strategy is widely considered to be pathbreaking. It shifted the department's focus uh, in, in many ways, from, from counterterrorism and counterinsurgency warfare to the challenges of major power rivalry. It shifted the focus from deterrence to a new catechism, compete, deter, and win. And it shifted focus from an outdated view of strategic conflict, largely born in the Cold War, to a view reflecting the multi-domain character of future war and reflecting also the multipolar world in which the U.S. extends security guarantees. Our speaker today was the lead architect of that strategy while serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development for the first two years of the Trump administration. He's here today to speak about his new book from Yale University Press. The book is informed by his experience in government, but also by a broad reading of history and a keen sense of American purpose. It is also informed by a deep concern about China's strategic ambitions, along with China's preparations for war with the United States. But the book is much more than a thoughtful reflection on a new problem. Bridge goes on to recommend a course of action for the United States, what he has defined as a strategy of denial. Uh, I'll let him explain that further. Uh, Bridge joined the Office of the Secretary of Defense in 2017 from the Center for a New American Security, where he was Director of Defense Programs. Uh, he previously served as an analyst uh, at the Center for Naval Analyses and in multiple advisory roles in the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. After his departure from OSD, he co-founded the Marathon Initiative. This is a policy group focused on developing strategies to prepare the United States for an era of sustained great power competition. Bridge is a prolific author. Uh, anyone uh, interested in the debate about strategic stability in the current and security environment will be familiar with the book that he co-edited a decade ago, published by the U.S. Army War College. And anyone who has attended one of the many CGSR workshops in which Bridge has participated knows him to be an ever thoughtful and often provocative speaker on the most challenging issues for defense planning today. Uh, to round out the, this introduction, let me note that Bridge uh, has uh, degrees from Harvard College and Yale Law School. Uh, before turning Bridge for his introductory remarks, let me just remind the group of the ground rules. Uh, when Bridge has wrapped up his remarks, I will turn to the hands raised in the electronic waiting room and uh, invite you to make comments or pose questions at that point. If you'd rather that I put the question on your behalf, send a, a note to me in the chat function. Bridge, thanks so much for your leadership on these issues. Thanks so much for the new book. Thanks so much for making the time to engage with our community today on, on, on the, the core arguments here. Over to you. You're muted up. Thank you, rookie mistake. Th thank you very much to you, uh, Brad, to CGSR and to Lawrence Livermore for the kind invitation. It's a particular pleasure uh, to be here with you, Brad, who from whom I've learned so much over over well over a decade, and who is a uh, I would I would say the dean of the uh, thinkers on strategic strategic studies and, and strategic deterrence uh, issues, uh, and and uh, as as we've discussed, uh, those who've had a chance or who will have a chance to flip through the book will I know find find Brad's uh, fingerprints. Uh, uh, in many places, although the the most obvious may be that my my use of the term theory of victory, which which Brad has really revivified and reshaped uh, in in recent years in a very helpful way, and which actually the 2018 national defense strategy was also very uh, influenced by, if I can say. 
So, uh, well, thank you. As, as Brad kindly said, I, I have a new book out called The Strategy of Denial. Uh, and I thought I would, I would open up by giving kind of an overview uh, and then we can go into the, the, the questions uh, and, and comments, uh, uh, and hopefully a rich discussion. So the basic impetus behind this book is my grave concern about the mismatch between the grand and defense strategies that America is actually pursuing, not necessarily what's written on paper, and our actual power on the other. To a large degree, I think America is basically continuing to pursue a strategy of global engagement and heavy forward presence in all three key theaters, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. Yet we just don't have the overabundance of power to do that anymore. We're no longer as dominant as we were after the Cold War. We're no longer in the unipolar moment. This is above all because of the rise of China, which is now as large or by some measures a larger economy than, than the United States is. Moreover, the share of global power is shifting away from the United States and its established global allies, or I should say the US allies. In that context, then, this book tries to wrestle with what our grand strategy should be, but in particular, what our defense strategy should be as an outgrowth of that grand strategy. This is especially important now because we can't simply overwhelm all the potential threats out there with an overabundance of resources. We can't just keep muddling through. If we don't make choices, we risk overextension, defeat, and even catastrophe. Therefore, we need to make hard calls. In this context, a strategy is really important. What I mean by a strategy, though, is not some clever master plan. Rather, it's a framework, a simplifying logic with which to make choices and prioritize. Without such a logic, there's no coherent way to tell what's important and what's not, what's a threat and what's not. In the situation of scarce resources in which we now find ourselves, that's an invitation to disaster. So what is that logic? Well, first, a grand strategy, excuse me, a defense strategy must proceed from an overall grand strategy. In this respect, my argument is that the basic purpose of American foreign policy should be to ensure that no other state can dominate any of the key regions of the world, defined as one of the areas with concentrated wealth and power. This is the best way to protect Americans' prosperity, freedom, and ultimately security, since if a state could dominate one of these key regions, it could use the enormous ensuing leverage to coerce others, including, if strong enough, the United States itself. In practice, these key regions are, in order, Asia, then Europe, North America itself, and more narrowly, the Persian Gulf, which is much smaller, but has concentrated oil and gas reserves. By far the most important of these is Asia, which currently constitutes more than 40% of global GDP, and that share is growing. It's set to be half before long. Europe is second at roughly 25%. If a state could dominate one of these regions, it could use that power to coerce Americans over their jobs and economic security, their way of life, and their liberties. Asia is not only the most important region of the world, it's also where the world's most plausible regional hegemon is, China. China constitutes roughly half of Asia's power. It therefore stands a real chance of becoming predominant there. Russia, by contrast, is not even the most powerful state in Europe, and Iran comprises roughly only a fifth of the power of the Middle East. Together, these factors mean that denying China hegemony over Asia must be the cardinal objective of US foreign policy. Asia is the world's most important region, and China its most plausible regional hegemon. More to the point, the evidence before all our eyes indicates that China is indeed seeking regional hegemony, if not more. This isn't surprising. Every rising great power in history has sought such hegemony. There is little reason to expect China would not follow this pattern with all its advantages. Now, just because it's natural, though, doesn't mean it's acceptable for us. So how should the United States seek to deny China this goal in ways that are consistent with Americans' willpower and strength? First off, let me emphasize that this latter part of the criterion, as Brad suggested, is critical. Denying China regional hegemony over Asia is a very significant American interest, but it's not truly existential. Sorry. Um, it's not likely to be a matter of national survival for us. Therefore, our strategies need to be proportioned to this reality. We can't have strategies for what is a very important but not genuinely existential interests that involve existential sacrifices. Rather, we need strategies, especially defense strategies, since they involve killing and dying in large numbers, that are reasonably proportioned to the interests at stake. So what's the right strategy for America to deny China regional hegemony in light of this? 
The core of the answer is an anti-hegemonic coalition. That is a more or less formal grouping of nations banding together to resist China's dominance of Asia. This coalition can take any number of forms and members. The natural candidates include Japan, India, Australia, South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and so forth. There just need to be enough states working together to outweigh China and its own coalition, which is likely to include states like Cambodia and Pakistan. Now, the Quad, which, of which we've heard a lot recently, might be the basis of such coalition, but it may take other forms. For instance, AUKUS might be uh, an overlay on it, and U.S. alliances will also exist, I think, coterminously with it. Indeed, the coalition need not be explicit at all. The condition is simply that enough states be working together to deny China's hegemony over Asia and that it be resilient to whatever strategy Beijing pursues to that end. The U.S. role in this coalition, though, is critical. Think of it as the external cornerstone balancer. Now, why is this role so important? It's not necessarily obvious. Actually, the ideal for Americans would be to disengage, sit back, and let others bear the responsibilities, costs, and risks of balancing China. We were basically able to do this in the first century and a half of our history, letting Great Britain and others worry about the balance of power in what was then the decisive theater of Europe, and while we could profit from their, their, their uh, balancing behavior. The problem is that this passive approach is very unlikely to work vis-a-vis -vis China and Asia today. The reason is that China is just too strong relative to the other states in the region. No other state could plausibly lead a coalition to balance against Beijing. Each state would be too vulnerable to China's strength and ire. This is especially because China has a naturally good strategy to defeat any anti-hegemonic coalition, what I think of as a focused and sequential strategy. This is a strategy of focusing on and isolating coalition members in sequence, progressively weakening the coalition until Beijing can establish its dominance of the area. In other words, Beijing's strategy is unlikely to be deliberately precipitating a massive war that will array all its opponents against it at the same time. This would likely lead to its defeat and at minimum would incur great cost and risk. This is of course what happened to Germany in the Second World War, for instance. Instead, Beijing is incentivized to go after coalition members one by one or in small clumps, progressively weakening the coalition until it falls apart. Think of this as an analog to Bismarck's approach in the 1860s and 1870s. Now, if states in Asia think they will be vulnerable to this strategy, to Beijing focused strength and ire, they are much more likely to decide to bandwagon with China, reasoning that they're better off cutting a deal than being punished standing alone. And this is actually quite rational. And it can happen, I think, quite quickly. And actually, the Bismarck example is illuminating. If you think of where Prussia was in 1863 versus where it was in 1871, it's a radical and dramatic change. In some ways, I think of it as an analogous potentially to the run on the market. If states see that the anti-hegemonic coalition is hollow and others are, are defecting, there could be a stampede. So how do we deal with this problem? A key part of the solution of getting states to stand strong in the face of Beijing's so focused and sequential strategy is alliances. Now, alliances are something different than just being in a loose coalition together. Alliances are strong signals of resolve, especially by a cornerstone balancer like the United States to defend another state. They provide queasy states with the confidence they will be defended against China by the big heavy in the coalition. In effect, we can think of them as the steel in the spine of the anti-hegemonic coalition. But the issue with alliances is that they also entangle. That's their whole point. They put the cornerstone balancer's credibility on the line so it has a real incentive to fight. But if it doesn't, its credibility will suffer. And Brad has, has I think, illuminated us all on, these, on this uh, problem uh, for, for a number of years. And credibility does matter. Now, not so much in a general global sense, but particularly in what I think of as a differentiated sense. Nervous states in Asia are naturally going to wonder whether the United States is actually going to come to their aid, given how strong China is. America's interests in Asia are very important, but they are also partial. And China can do a lot of damage, not only to Asian states, but to America itself. So America might say it's committed, but is it? This is the point that Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines has impolitely, but fundamentally very accurately raised. Now, if these nervous Asian states see America balk at defending a country against China that Washington is allied with in Asia, 
they will quite reasonably wonder whether they too will be left out to dry if the going gets too tough for the United States. This is different than saying that the United States has to follow through on every commitment. I believe, for instance, the U.S. can get out of commitments in the Middle East like Afghanistan, and countries in Asia will be able to differentiate that from their fate vis-a-vis -vis China. Now, I differentiate that. I, I, let me distinguish that from the way that this, uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan has been conducted, uh, which I think has been a debacle, but happy to discuss that in, in the question and answer. But the point obtains that withdrawal is consistent from other secondary regions, uh, is clearly differentiable. Indeed, reducing in the Middle East may well, and I think likely will, demonstrate our seriousness about our Asian commitments by allowing us to focus our efforts and resources. But by the same logic, all the more important then is vindicating our Asian alliances vis-a-vis -vis Beijing. If the U.S. balks at defending, say, the Philippines, which is an archipelago in the Western Pacific under the darkening shadow of Chinese power, well, what should Japan take from that? Also an archipelago in the Western Pacific under the darkening shadow of Chinese power, not to mention Indonesia, let alone Vietnam or Thailand, which are, you know, aren't even allies of Thailand in the, only in the barest sense, and are actually on the Asian mainland, which is less favorable for us. So this discussion brings out the critical importance of our defense perimeter. Now, the idea of a defense perimeter, I think, sounds kind of archaic, but it's actually highly relevant. The U.S. defense perimeter is the geographic representation of those countries that we're committed to defend, those on which we've staked our differentiated credibility. So who is in and who is out is really important. The basic purpose of these alliances is to make the coalition work, and the coalition's basic purpose is to have and sustain a favorable regional balance of power vis-a-vis -vis China in order to deny its goal of dominating Asia. So we need enough states in the coalition to do that. And if some of those states need alliance commitments, then we need to make them in order to ensure the coalition works. The problem is that we face polar risks of undercommitting and overcommitting. If we undercommit and bring in too few countries, the coalition will be too weak and China will become regionally dominant. But if we overcommit, on the other hand, we risk becoming entangled in unfavorable and sapping wars, undermining our strength and the American people's will. Again, to use a financial analogy, I think of this as the, the you know, the, the um, interest rate problem. You know, you, you go too far, it's one problem. You go too, too short, it's another problem. So it's, it's a matter of balance here. So where should we draw the line? Now, some countries are obvious. On the one hand, you can't have a meaningful coalition in Asia without Japan and Australia, and they're very defensible, relatively speaking. On the other hand, Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan are weak and they're indefensible, okay? Some, like India, and uh, at least up to now, Vietnam may not even want an alliance. So that's convenient, uh, especially if, as long as they stay strong. Now, the rub of the matter for our defense perimeter then comes down to places like Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, and a few others in East and Southeast Asia. These countries are significant economies, so their disposition matters in the balance of power, and they're important for geographic and other reasons, but they may be difficult to defend. But how difficult, costly, and risky to defend? This is a critical question, and this is one of military strategy, of how to fight wars. If we can develop and implement a military strategy that brings the costs and risks of defending these more exposed countries down, then we can bring more states into our perimeter without violating our core duty to keep the risks and the costs for the American people proportionate to the importance of the interests at stake. The right military strategy, in other words, will allow us to have a bigger coalition at a reasonable level of cost and risk underpinning the whole edifice. So before we decide which country should be in the perimeter, we need to understand what the right military strategy for the United States is. This right military strategy for the United States is a denial defense. A denial defense is one that denies China its ability to use military force to achieve its political objectives. In particular, it focuses on de denying China the efficacy of its best military strategy. We need to focus on Beijing's best strategy, not its most likely or its most destructive, because its best is the most gainful for it and the most dangerous to our interests in real terms. China's best geopolitical strategy against the anti-hegemonic coalition is, as I discussed, the focused and sequential strategy, picking off members one by one until it collapses. Beijing's best military strategy is a subcomponent of that. To advance towards this goal is to use targeted military force against vulnerable members of the coalition, irresistibly imposing its will on the targeted state while avoiding triggering 
a full scale intervention by the rest of the coalition, which would you know, precipitate that very large war that Beijing has a strong interest in avoiding. So in light of this, Beijing's best military strategy, in my view, is a fait accompli against a vulnerable coalition member like the Philippines, Vietnam, or above all, in the near term, Taiwan. A fait accompli would involve Beijing seizing and occupying one of these countries before the broader coalition could come to their effective aid. Beijing would then present the coalition with a new set of facts, try to do the far more difficult task of reversing these new facts at great cost and risk, or accept these new reality and deal with it. Now it's a very good and therefore dangerous strategy. It's entirely plausible, not only that Beijing could do this, it actually is building the military for power projection, not only against Taiwan, but well beyond, but also that the coalition would indeed balk at the cost and risks of re reversing this result. I think we have to be very candid with ourselves about this. The fait accompli works best for Beijing because it leverages the respective advantages of both direct force and persuasion. It uses direct force to subordinate the targeted country, but then primarily relies on deterrent threats to dissuade the rest of the coalition from coming to the target's effective defense. This is, why, this is a wise balance because cost imposition alone, for instance, bombing and blockading, risks beating up on the target country without getting it to give up its core goods, as we have repeatedly found in North Vietnam, North Korea, and Iraq before 2003, or as Hitler found against Britain in 1940. Instead, Beijing would use direct force, including ultimately invasion of a target's key territory to get it to concede. In the case of Taiwan, this would presumably include full-scale annexation, but it need not. China could ultimately use such a strategy against the Philippines or Vietnam without wanting to annex them, as the Germans did in 1870 uh, against, against France without, I mean, actually Bismarck's ideal political objectives included no annexation. Uh, it was rather for a political objective for the unification of Germany. It's also worth recalling that America, albeit mistakenly in my view, invaded Iraq not to annex it, but to coerce it over what Baghdad regarded as a core good regarding weapons of mass destruction. At the same time, the fait accompli exhibits restraint, therefore enticing or sort of alluring other luring other co coalition members to give up their targeted coalition partner in hopes that they'll be spared. Now, if Beijing can make this fait accompli strategy work against, say, Taiwan, it could replicate it against another vulnerable coalition member like the Philippines or Vietnam. But as I suggested earlier, I don't think Beijing would have to go after each coalition member. If it could use it against a few states successfully, especially U.S. allies, given the central importance of America's differentiated credibility of the whole coalition, that would very ma likely make clear that the coalition was hollow. It would then collapse and Beijing would become regional hegemon because of this stampede effect. So the purpose of a denial defense is to prevent this from working. The denial defense strategy does so by focusing on denying Beijing's victory conditions, its theory of victory, hat tip, bread. It's a negative criterion. It focuses on denying the enemy's goals, not on attaining our own positive objectives. This sounds bad, but it's actually good. It means a lower bar politically. As long as the embattled ally can hold on, a la Britain 1940, the coalition wins and China loses. It may not be pleasant, but it will be enough. China is the one that has to decisively change this. Think back to shellings, cars you know, running into each other. For Beijing's strategy to work, it first and foremost must get the targeted coalition member, say Taiwan, to give up. It therefore must exert control or do enough damage to force the targeted state to give up its autonomy and even independence, the very definition of core goods. To do this, Beijing is very likely to have to occupy what I think of as the key territory of a targeted state, basically its capital, major populated areas. Blockade may work for this goal, but it's very hard. It's also likely to induce American intervention and it ultimately leaves the choice of whether to surrender, not only in America's hands, but in Taiwan's hands. There's a reason that countries essentially always choose to resort to invasion over blockade when they have the option. As Napoleon put it, if you want to take Vienna, take Vienna. And Napoleon actually was planning to invade Great Britain to continue the analogy, but he couldn't pull it off. Without invasion, Be Beijing very likely won't have the leverage to force the target to give up. For example, Taiwan is very unlikely to give up due to the loss of, say, Kimoy and Matsu or others of the offshore islands. But if China occupies Taipei and Kaohsiung and the island's populated areas, Taiwan won't have any choice. It will be forced into capitulation. Then America and its partners will face the awful prospect of having to wage a much larger and fiercer and more difficult war to eject China from its gains. 
In light of this, the United States and its partners in the coalition can deny China's strategy in one of two ways. This stems from the fact that for the Fete Accompli to succeed, Beijing needs to seize and hold its target's key territory. Obviously, it has to seize it, but if it can't hold it in the face of readily available defending forces, there's no Fete Accompli. So the U.S. and its partners can deny China's ability to seize, say, Taiwan's key territory in the first place, or its ability to hold it. The first would emphasize striking at China's invading flotilla and air armada before they reach Taiwan. You know, when we think of the so-called Akmanic uh, criteria, the 350 ships in the first 72 hours, that kind of thing, which makes a lot of sense. But the second uh, level of line of effort would focus on attacking Chinese forces, presumably while exposed, once they have landed uh, or airdropped on Taiwan before they've consolidated their, any gains. Moreover, the U.S. and its Confederates can do both attacking Chinese forces as they cross the strait, and once they're using both methods to deny Beijing its ability to seize and hold Taiwan's key territory. Which thrust to emphasize will depend on a range of military factors, such as geography and topography, like whether the defending uh, country is an island, as well as the state of the military balance and po uh, political considerations as well. Regardless of the balance of thrust, the point is to prevent China from seizing and holding the targeted state's key territory. Now, if the United States and its partners can do this, China will be forced to give up or escalate to try to reverse its defeat. This is, uh, in this respect, though, Beijing under these conditions will bear what I think of as a heavy burden of escalation. Now, this is a critical concept in my argument. Both the United States and China possess survivable nuclear arsenals. In fact, China is apparently massively growing as we speak. No matter what the other does, they can always do the worst kind of damage to each other. Thus. While a war between China and the United States could escalate out of control to thermonuclear devastation, both sides would have the strongest possible incentives to avoid such an outcome. Therefore, any war between them would very likely remain limited. But limited how? The rules of such a war between the two, world's two greatest powers would neither be fixed in advance nor presided over by an omnipotent umpire. Rather, the sides themselves would set and police them conscious not only of the threat from each other, but the perception and potential intervention by the rest of the world. This all would be subject to deliberate action and thus to strategy. Crucially, the burden of escalation would play a decisive role in forming the limits and determining the resolution of such a limited war. The side could force the other to have to escalate in a dramatic way, thereby increasing the targeted side's resolve and drawing international support to it would benefit greatly. So to be concrete, if China had did not been denied its goals in a fait accompli attempt, it would face a choice. Now it could escalate. It could do so vertically using greater violence and attacking more sensitive targets against the United States and its partners, including by crossing the ultimate th the threshold of nuclear weapons. It could also or alternatively escalate horizontally, attacking a wider number of countries or targets in more places. But crucially, neither of these would, would change the facts on the ground if a denial of defense had been successful over Taiwan. At the same time, they would demonstrate China's aggressiveness and unreasonableness, catalyzing Americans' righteous anger and thus harsh responses, while eliciting greater and more active third party intervention on the coalition's behalf. If China did this, the United States and others could respond, escalating their own attacks and imposing further costs on China and doing so in ways that would seem just and proportionate because reactive. In these circumstances, China's efforts to escalate its way out of defeat would only draw more pain and ire to itself without turning its fortunes in the central battle. As with a victim struggling against a boa constrictor, every attempt by Beijing to struggle out of the predicament would actually just make its fate worse. Or alternatively, rather than escalating, Beijing could give up, perhaps just to lick its wounds in hopes of trying again, again later. I mean, North Korea has been in that situation for the last 70 years. Or genuinely, although that may not be very probable, either way, any, either of these would be a satisfactory outcome for the coalition to return to its fundamental victory criteria. So this is the ideal, a denial defense that would defeat a Chinese invasion of a vulnerable ally like Taiwan or the Philippines and leave the burden of escalation on China's shoulders. Now, what, however, if we can't do this though? This is a serious prospect. As the director of intelligence at Indo-PACOM, Admiral Studeman said recently, we may be too late vis-a-vis -vis China, particularly regarding Taiwan, is what I think he was suggesting in particular. Now, this failure might happen either because of our own or our allies' neglect. I think there's a wide sense that we have not been responding with a degree of vigor and focus to the China military challenge that is required, despite 
the revectoring of the 2018 national defense strategy and the third offset strategy and so forth. But it also might happen simply because China proves too strong and gains a military advantage over proximate states like Taiwan or the Philippines. In this case, we will need to find a way to uphold the favorable re regional balance of power via this coalition, even in the face of much greater Chinese military power. The key in this context will be generating the greater resolve needed to do this, the resolve to actually bring the coalition's latent power actively to bear. The big question, though, is how? My argument here is via what I call the binding strategy. This is basically the idea of deliberately arraying and developing our and our par partners' forces in such a way that China is compelled, if it wants to implement the focused and sequential strategy, to appear so menacing, aggressive, and ambitious that it will actually invariably catalyze the will of the fuller coalition to defeat its effort. The logic is to ensure that Beijing, by putting its best strategy into effect, will make clear to coalition members that they are better off defeating it now rather than later. This can be done if China's actions, such as attacking more states more aggressively and more cruelly, will show that it's more menacing than they might previously have thought. In a sense, it's to compel China to have to do what Japan did in late 1941, early 1942 in order to pursue its goal, alienate everyone and bring everyone in against it rather than salami slice. I actually think this is also kind of where our strategic posture ended up in Europe in the late and towards the end of the Cold War. Now, if we do this right, China will see that it has no good way to implement the focus and sequential strategy, and it should be deterred. So what are the implications of this argument for a denial of defense for our contemporary defense strategy? A particularly relevant question as the national defense strategy of uh, the Biden administration is being developed. In my view, the top priority for the American defense establishment must be ensuring that the China cannot subordinate a US ally or Taiwan in Asia. The first priority should be ensuring Beijing cannot subordinate Taiwan because it is Beijing's best target within our defense perimeter. And I think of it as kind of a quasi ally, about two thirds of an ally, which is enough to worry about. At the same time, the United States should maintain a strong nuclear deterrent and a focused but effective counterterrorism posture. On the nuclear front, my view is that we need a nuclear deterrent that's robust and effective enough to deal concurrently simultaneously with multiple uh, major nuclear threats. So we will have to, you know, what exactly that number comes out to, I don't know. But that's my view, that we do need a simultaneous force for the nuclear deterrent. Uh, and that our counterterrorism force should be more focused on efficiency and low cost, something that people have talked about a little bit, the national defense strategy called for, but relatively little work has been done, unfortunately. At the same time, if it's not too costly and doesn't detract from these other priorities, I think we should seek to maintain a missile defense posture against North Korea and Iran. On the other hand, in order to best em employ our now scarce resources in the context of our strategic challenges, I'm, my, firm, my view is that the United States should not size, shape, or posture its military to deal simultaneously with any other scenario alongside a war with, Ch with China over Taiwan. So we should have a one major war military focused on Asia. In fact, my view is, is that even if a war started elsewhere, obviously in the Middle East, but even in Europe, we would need to withhold for the primary fight. Uh, in order to deal with the strategic vacuum that, that's created by this reality, and I'd say it's created by the reality, not the strategy, U.S. allies, especially in Europe, as well as in the, in the Middle East, must carry the primary burden of their conventional defense, while allies in Asia, especially Japan and Taiwan, step up to play a greater role. Happy to talk more about the practical implications if that's of interest. So, in closing, this book is about war, about preparing for it, and how to win it, at a, well, win it or within reasonable co uh, context at a reasonable level of cost and risk. But the ultimate goal of the strategy is to be able to come to a decent peace. Indeed, in my view, an acceptable detente with China. Achieving this, however, will require firm and focused action and accepting the risk and distinct possibility of war. But only this will earn Americans the decent peace that I believe they deserve and desire. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions.